This is The Digital Factory, presented by Formlabs. I'm your host, John Bruner. In this series, we're going to explore digital manufacturing in conversations with experts who are changing the way things are made and shaping the future of the factory floor. On this first episode today, I'm joined by Max Lebovsky. He's the co-founder and CEO of Formlabs. Max, good to have you on. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So 3D printing is going to be a big topic of conversation throughout this podcast series and as well at the Digital Factory Conference that I'm hosting and that you're producing in June. So 3D printing is something that we heard a lot about during its early development phase a few years ago, and now it's something that seems a little bit quieter. Maybe the industry kind of has its heads down. What's the latest on 3D printing What's kind of the status of the industry overall? So there's there's certainly been steady, continuing, interesting developments in the technology and applications of 3D printing. And you know, for, for those of you who may not know it so well, 3D printing is actually about 30 years old. It's only been recently become well known to the public, but it's been going for a while. And what what's changed though with the sort of the public understanding is there's a big wave of hype maybe around starting about five years ago, where people got interested in the idea of consumer 3D printing or a 3D printer in the home. That sort of phase of at least the public discussion has mostly gone away, but there's still you know, a huge amount of interest in growing applications for 3D printing and different professional manufacturing engineering use cases. And what's emerged in the meantime? I mean, it seems like there's no longer the idea that everyone will have a 3D printer on their kitchen counter. But when you walk into something like an industrial design agency or any other kind of creative organization, they have a couple of 3D printers on a countertop somewhere. So has it become part of the workflow quietly inside certain industries? Yeah, absolutely. At this point, in almost any field where 3D design is part of what you're doing from product design, mechanical engineering, industrial design, architecture, jewelry, and even dental, not a place people think about people doing 3D design, but they, they do it there. 3D printing has found its way in and, and is either already very common in places like product design or sort of on track to be totally normal in dental. What's the underlying sort of technology shift that enabled all of that? Is it the same as what people saw in, in consumer 3D printing or is it a different set of underlying technological improvements? The sort of the core of 3D printing technology is that most of those have been around for a few decades. What we've focused on at Formlabs and what I think has accounted for a lot of the wider distribution of 3D printers in the last sort of five years is trying to take the powerful technology that used to only be available in sort of $50,000, $100,000 pieces of capital equipment and put it into more desktop type machines. You know, it's partially reducing the cost. It's partially making those machines easier to use. And it takes a lot of technology to make that happen, more automation, more software control, a lot of work into reducing the, the fundamental costs of these things. And that's made it so that, you know, the, the end goal we, we think about this part of 3D printing market is to make 3D printing more like 2D printing, where if you work on a document or you're in any way involved in some kind of 2D design, documents, photos, whatever, you press print on your office 2D printer and you don't really think about the cost or how long it's going to take or really worry about it. If you want the thing on paper, you get it. And I think we're part of the way to bringing 3D printing to that level for anyone involved in 3D design. Yeah. How have the design tools changed? I mean, it seems like there's there's been a terrific advancement in the kinds of workflow tools that are available to designers, right? As aspects of computer-assisted design have gone into the cloud. I've also started to see this idea of dispatching a design to 3D printing agency or kind of converting it fluidly to a file format that can be ingested by your 3D printing drivers. Yeah. The, the design, the progress of the design tools and the you know, democratization of of the design tools has definitely contributed to more people doing stuff where 3D printing is useful. Mm -hmm. So the cloud connected tools like Onshape or Autodesk Fusion 360 are making it a lot easier to just get access to the tools because typically this, this is like sort of thousands of dollars a seat type software. Now mm -hmm. it's easier to get a free trial or get started on a monthly basis and easier to learn, easier to share. So we're, we're big fans of those tools because uh, ultimately we need more people designing 3D stuff there's going to be more people needing 3D printers. The, the, these are obvious applications for 3D printing in the design process and the prototyping process. There's been a long dream of 3D printing in production, right, at, at scale. What's that field looking like right now? Have you started to see 3D printing become an essential part 
of, of production. Yeah, I think currently most of the excitement in 3D printing, since it's moved on from the consumer part of 3D printing, that it's, is around moving 3D printing into production and producing stuff at higher and higher volume. And this is something that we're also just starting to focus on at Forum Labs through a few you know new products we're, we're going to release. And it's... There, there's a few examples where 3D printing is already being used in high volume, a lot more to come. And one of the best examples are Invisalign braces. So these are these clear plastic braces and Invisalign's producing something like tens of millions of these braces per year. And they're, they're, they're not printed directly, but they're, everyone is made from a printed form. So they print a model that they then vacuum form the plastic on. And so they're printing tens of millions of models a year. They do this at high volume and then yeah, as a result, you can get these custom braces delivered at you know not crazy costs. That's a product that's basically only possible with 3D printing. Mm-hmm. There's a few other examples like that with hearing aids. So a lot of hearing aid shells are done with bit, fit to fit your ear. And then there's some next generation applications that people are talking about, like custom orthotics or even custom shoes. So there's a lot of sort of consumer products around the body that are coming. Everyone's body is different. So it's the first obvious application for this type of mass customization. Absolutely. And then the other probably major area where 3D printing and production is starting to take off is in lower volume, higher value parts that have kind of unusual geometries that take advantage of 3D printing. So a lot of stuff in aerospace, GE has been very uh, public about trying to print certain metal parts in uh, some of their new uh, jet engines. And so in general, you want to look for something the stuff that makes sense to be 3D printed in production benefits from being custom or is kind of high value and low volume. And so those are the places you'll first see 3D printing in production. The other place that, that's interested me as, a, as an example of the economics you're describing is 3D printing is apparently widely used in certain kinds of non-structural parts of airplanes too, especially ductwork apparently is largely 3D printed in modern airliners. There you have not, not necessarily a... Um, an extremely low volume manufacturing process, but a reasonably low volume manufacturing process, and one where the cost of re-engineering something is vastly larger than the cost of, of using a slightly more expensive manufacturing process. Every few Boeing 737s, you know, Boeing gets feedback from its customers about the precise location of the, you know, the galley where they reheat the meals and decide that they want to adjust the ventilation slightly. And it's it's uh, an airplane is so expensive. The context of 3D printing large part is not that bad, but the cost of re-engineering, you know, a manufacturing process for an airliner is exceptionally expensive. So they're able to just sort of use this prototype level manufacturing and, and save a great deal of money. Yeah, and so, the, you know, there, there are some great examples of 3D printing going into production already. But as we sort of discussed, they're, they're really these kind of unusual high value applications. What we're excited about is making that more accessible. The same way that we sort of made 3D printing for design and prototyping more accessible, we'd like to do that for production as well. And one of the biggest aspects of that is driving the per part cost down. That's one of the, you know, when we look at what's going to push 3D printing into production, that's one of the main questions. Um, basically, it comes down to two questions is, can you make the part with all the requirements of the part, uh, which is often largely a materials question? Can you make something out of the right materials? And then the other part is, can you drive the per part cost down to be competitive with some traditional manufacturing methods? And so we're we putting a lot of focus on that. What is the focus on? Is it on uh, new kinds of resins that are less expensive or, or more performant? Or is it on other aspects of the process? There's there's sort of three parts to the per part cost. There's like the amortized cost of the machine. So you know, you have to pay for the machine, it's going to produce certain parts. There's the cost of the materials and there's the cost of the labor. Actually, the cost of the labor is usually the, the largest factor in 3D printing, which is a little counterintuitive because 3D printing is thought of as this kind of box that makes something from entirely automatically. But usually there's stuff you have to do before and after by hand. So applying automation is a really big direction. In terms of the machine amortization, because we sort of started with these low-cost machines, we're actually in a really great position there where we have by far the lowest cost sort of per productivity. And then materials, there's some challenge, sort of fundamental limits to how low you can get the 3D printing materials, but a lot of that is just driving the volume up. So if we've solved most of the rest of it and companies really are ready to put this stuff into production, then the materials, there's a, there's a lot of room that the those prices can come down already. I mean, one, one of the 
most notable things about Form Labs since you released the the Form One has has been that it is kind of the professional quality, user friendly 3D printer. Other sort of more hobbyist oriented, as well as other really industrial 3D printers, take some degree of expertise to run. So I imagine that's something that crossed your mind as you consider that labor is the most expensive part of 3D printing. And it's especially expensive if you have to basically hire an additive manufacturing authority to run your 3D printing shop. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, it's interesting. We didn't, in our very beginning of the company, we didn't know that we would end up uh, adding this sort of production aspect to what we were doing because I assumed that that was better done with bigger machines, but in large part because of what you're describing, because we've had to put a lot of effort into making these things sort of easy to use and run without any um, port or interfacing from someone helping, that also turns them into sort of automated production machines. Yeah. I know a couple of institutions that have bought extremely expensive metal SLS machines and basically say that they never get used because the training process to use it is so long. Everyone is so anxious that this, you know, million dollar machine is going to get broken. The, the, the ways to screw it up in a very, very dramatically are uh, so numerous that no one feels comfortable using it. Uh, let's talk about the, the materials, uh, this, the second part of, of the sort of the three inputs that you mentioned. You, you've got a few interesting materials, including the dental resin, what is that exactly? So we, we actually have now a range of a few resins targeted at different dental applications. So de- dentistry and 3D printing is really uh, exploding right now. There, there's a number of different applications. The first one we launched, which was our first sort of biocompatible material, is a surgical guide. So when you're getting an implant done, if you're missing a tooth and they're sort of implanting a tooth into the bone, the dentist normally does that freehand. So if you can imagine, he sticks a drill in your mouth and sort of aims at the bone and <laughs> you know, hopefully puts the hole in the right place to put the tooth in. But with a scan of your teeth and of your sort of bone structure, you can print a little plastic, looks like a mouth guard that has a hole in it and that guides the drill and it produces better results and streamlines the process. And, you know, sort of everyone agrees it makes sense. And this idea has been around for 10 plus years, but because the machines have been too expensive, because the whole workflow from the scan data to producing the parts to using the printer has been difficult, they haven't been widely deployed. But we're already doing huge numbers. We've had some tens of thousands of surgeries now done with with our printed guides. And so we're really broadening that. And that's actually just one of the dental applications where we're in the process of launching several more. One really excited one are printed dentures. So you can, same thing, using scan data, you can print a denture that fits someone's mouth. Uh, normally, this is a sort of very analog process where they'll take impressions of the gum and basically a technician will sculpt dentures for you. Huh. But with, with scan data and 3D printing, you can get a better result faster, fits better. So, so you're actually 3D printing teeth that people are putting in their mouths. Yeah. So that with the dentures, there's kind of two ways to do it. You always print the, the pink part, the gum part that holds the teeth. And then you can either print the teeth directly or you can insert in kind of stock ceramic teeth. Just printing the part that holds them and having that fit well, that's actually the part that needs to be most custom. And any kind of resin that spends hours and hours in your mouth, possibly also chewing food, has to be pretty performant, right? Yeah, that's uh, one of the, the challenges with 3D printing for dental and medical applications is getting to the necessary sort of biocompatibility and reaching the certifications. So there's sort of different levels depending on where it is in your body and for how long. And dentures are definitely a, a, one, a higher level application. Yeah, it strikes me as a remarkable area for a startup to be working in. I think of like the medical devices field as being highly constrained by regulation and by, you know, concerns about the corner cases of biocompatibility and liability and stuff like that. It is and it's challenging. And that's part of why we, we actually didn't go into the dental market until really the last year or so, because we needed to uh, really get the hardware and the rest of the system to a really good, reliable, stable place. And we knew this was a sort of a more demanding market than some other parts of the 3D printing sector. Right, so, right. Now, now we're taking it on. Before we go on to some more forward-looking stuff about 3D printing and additive manufacturing, I just want to remind you, join Form Labs on June 5th for the Digital Factory, a one-day conference on digital manufacturing hosted at the MIT Media Lab in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Intermingle with business pioneers, investors, innovators, startups, and thought leaders reinventing the factory floor. See the full agenda and get your ticket at digitalfactory.xyz. Use the code TDFPODCAST 
for a 50% listener discount. So, uh, Max, let's let's look forward a little bit. You mentioned a few kind of ecosystem components that have made it possible to do cool stuff with 3D printing, scanners, for instance, design software. This broader marketplace has developed really remarkably in the last few years and made 3D printing more compelling. What's still missing? What do you need the industry to create in order to really push additive manufacturing forward? It definitely is a workflow, as as you described, an ecosystem where you're always either designing a part or scanning a part or getting access to a part from somewhere else. And you're always doing something with it at the end of it, which usually involves integrating it into some, you know, something else or some finishing steps. So we definitely need all of those pieces to develop. I think there's there's been a lot of progress, the design software and demoing different applications. I think the the materials capabilities is really one of the things that's going to drive more more application. There's so many things that can be 3D printed uh, right now in terms of the geometry, and that would it would already make sense in terms of cost, even though you know we, the industry is working to drive that down. But the materials really are a big limiting factor. The range of materials that, in terms of plastics, that are available to injection molding or other types of manufacturing processes is so much larger, and you can get to so many different things in terms of strength or stiffness or hardness or appearance. Three D printing is still just sort of in the infancy of catching up to that range of materials. And who who needs to work on the materials? Is it something where you've kind of hit the limit of what? the 3D printer manufacturers are able to do, and now you need the involvement of the, the wider chemical industry? Or where do you see the innovation coming from in materials? So the, the big chemical companies are definitely getting excited and getting involved. Um, you know, name your BASF, DuPont, et cetera. They, are, uh, they all have programs in 3D printing. And we work, you know, with some of those manufacturers as suppliers for components for our materials. At least for stereolithography, the materials are so integrated with the machine that for the near future, we expect that the innovation is going to be driven by the machine manufacturers because you really need to design the material and the machine and the software that drives it all together. But I think this will evolve over time. And certainly, you know, we, we don't process the, the oil to make, to make <laughs> the materials. So there, there's a kind of a chemical food chain here that we're a part of and that we have to work with to make these materials. On the software side, an area that particularly interests me is generative design and the thought that additive manufacturing could reflect these very complex designs that you get when you use genetic algorithms and sort of generative AI. Is that something you're thinking about a lot at Formlabs? Absolutely. We, uh, you know, actually some of the speakers at Digital Factory, uh, we're going to have a company called Entopology there that uh, specializes in design tools for making these unusual structures that can only be 3D printed. And Spencer Wright from N Topology will be a guest on this podcast in a, a later episode. So, yeah, I think tools like this allow you to go beyond just replacing some part that you made through some other way with 3D printing, but actually making a better part that can only be with 3D printing, especially in, in the near term, is, 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 is very important. Just replacing some part you can make some other way. Usually there's, there's already a working way, but if you can make it better, lighter, faster, stronger through 3D printing that that offers some real advantages. Yeah, it's hard to appreciate if you've never designed something for manufacturing, how much time goes into that process and the process of figuring out how you're going to machine something, going back and refining the original design when you realize that the CNC mill can't execute it properly. It's just, it's enormously time consuming. And as you suggest, there are a lot of designs that simply can't be fabricated with conventional subtractive techniques. So it's a really, really cool outlook. It promises to free designers remarkably. On the flip side, there's sort of like a training aspect for designing for 3D printing as well, where while you can make things you can't make through other processes, 3D printing has its own unique set of limitations, especially as we talk about more production use cases where people might be designing specifically to be produced with 3D printing, not just to produce it one time as a prototype. We can help adoption by getting more people to, to understand how to work with the tools. And it's, it's something that takes a long time because your sort of average mechanical engineer, mechanical designer learned there's sort of implicit understanding of the different fabrication processes and the constraints on the parts they're designing. And they learn that over time, slowly picking it up. And most manufacturing technologies are hundred, hundreds of years old. So 3D printing is still sort of in the infancy of being understood by the people designing these parts. 
generally speaking, how much variation is there in capability at the level that you know a mechanical engineer or a mechanical designer would need to understand between different machines that use the same process and and different 3D printing processes altogether. I mean, if you're a mechanical designer, you inherently understand that something is going to be made on a mill, so you need these considerations, or on a lathe, so you need these considerations. How much variation along those lines is there between different processes? There's still a lot, and honestly, the industry is suffering even from sort of basic things like what do you even call the different processes? Every company invents their own name for it, even when they're sort of similar processes, so it's in a way slowing down the adoption. There still are a lot of differences between the different machines. So I think it's still sort of the, the Wild West where there's going to be new types of machines overtaking other machines evolving over time. We've already seen sort of some 3D printing technologies mostly fade away, uh, new ones coming in. And that's, yeah, that's what it looks like today. I'm hopeful that software will be able to address the the issue to some degree. I mean, the, the latest generation of CAD CAM software that anticipates the manufacturing process as you're designing it and makes it very easy to evaluate what you've designed in terms of fabrication has really given us a model for what the whole field might look like in a few years. If the software understands these fabrication constraints, it becomes much easier for the designer to just do his or her thing. I agree. And I think there's there's a huge role for the software to play. One thing we're trying to figure out is how to work better with the CAD companies how to better integrate our tools, which already have some of that knowledge of the production process, but aren't design tools in and of themselves. Right. So let's talk about some of your plans at Formlabs. You've been teasing this thing called the Fuse One. No one knows what it is. <laughs> Can you hint? I can't say a lot. We're going to announce it uh, June 5th. And I'm, I'm really excited because it's going to be sort of the, the biggest announcement we've made since we launched the company really in the product at almost five years ago now on Kickstarter with the Form 1. But it's, uh, you know, a lot of what we're talking about here about materials and more production-ready type 3D printers. That's, um, I would think, along those lines. But we are definitely sticking with sort of our core value proposition of taking really powerful technology that's been inaccessible and making it more widely available. I can't wait to, to show everybody. <laughs> cool, cool. Well, you can, uh, listeners can learn more about that perhaps at the Digital Factory which is this uh, event that Form Labs is producing in partnership with Desktop Metal on June 5th in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Max is going to be speaking there. I'm hosting it, and you can find out more about it at digitalfactory.xyz. Max, thanks so much for coming on. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. Thanks, John. The Digital Factory podcast is presented by Form Labs, makers of accessible, precise, reliable, 3D printers for the desktop. Visit formlabs.com to learn more or head over to digitalfactory.xyz to get your ticket to our one-day conference on digital manufacturing at the MIT Media Lab in Cambridge, Massachusetts on June 5th.